UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, welcome back to SABC News. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. As we move into the high-level week of the General Assembly, we see two broad competing themes emerging. Geopolitical divides from the war in Ukraine to coups in West Africa, the conflict in Sudan comes to mind, and then the very broad developmental agenda and a key SDG summit which seeks to reinvigorate momentum on implementation that continues to lag at the midway point of the 2030 development agenda. You say that the United Nations was designed specifically for moments of challenge like those before us. And yet there are very real doubts, DSG, that this institution, in its current form, can meet this moment. How do you thread this needle? It's tough, but we don't give up on hope, right? I mean, this was a very ambitious agenda at a time no one thought we could make the transition from a set of MDGs, eight of them, that were pretty narrow, but they did galvanize a collective response to something that's much deeper that talks about people's economies, people's governance systems, um, the planet itself and the, and the crisis that we're going through. So it was never gonna be an easy lift. Um, halfway through, it really is sobering. I mean, the targets that are being met globally, 15% is miserable. Um, and then we are exacerbating this with the crises that you talk about. However, there are signs that in spite of that all, efforts are being made and things are happening. And what we need to do is to come back here and have an honest conversation on how we're going to keep the promise in the second half. Mm. Um, and there are indications of that, indications of that where we're seeing the frustrations um, and the voice of Africa actually out there now. It was before very muted. Now it's out there. It happened at the Africa Climate Summit where everyone is saying, look, we have solutions to offer. This is not just a charity case. Uh, investments are what are needed and this is where we need the investments. We need them in energy. We need them in uh, food systems. We need them in education. So people have been very specific um, and I think that that sort of sobering moment of how far off track we are could at this moment of crisis, which is what we're set up for, um, provide the impetus to, uh, to get it right? The issue of multipolarity appears to be the new buzzword on the geopolitical stage, particularly in the context of growing geopolitical mistrust driven by the big powers, Russia, China, the United States. And yet we have the United Nations that is built on the principle of consensus that is increasingly hard to achieve. We often hear from people like yourself the urgent need to build trust, cohesion, solidarity among member states, but how do you get there in practice when national self-interest and sovereignty continues to show themselves as major obstacles to that consensus? I think the, the international impetus to do something has always been in one's national interest. What we have to do is to find common ground in those national interests that will get us back in this town hall to have these discussions. Since the probably the war in Ukraine, everyone's gone off into their echo chambers where that's where they're getting the responses they need for the electorates they have. And whether it's you're suffering under that impact of the war and, and the climate crisis or the lack of recovery from COVID, or it's one where you want to get the support you need to do what you need to do to, to respond to the war. It's not in the United Nations. And that's what we need to do is to say, look, we've got some problems here that are bigger than any one region or country. And it has always been that way. And that's why we have these discussions here. They're not comfortable discussions. You're not going to like hearing some of the stuff that you hear, but you have to hear it in order to find a solution to solve it. And, and maybe uh, in this opportunity of the, of the 78th, we can achieve that. Um, and, and I'm hoping that with the number of heads of state and government that we have coming, the fact that everybody's going to be reminded about the SDG promise, that we can garner some support uh, for for humanity and what, what everyone's facing, which is really, um, it's, a, it's not knowing what's gonna happen next. The uncertainty of it all needs leadership and it needs some concrete pathways that people can get back on track. So in the context of that leadership, you mentioned the heads of state and mm. government that are coming, the, uh, but only of the permanent five heads of state and government to attend this year's uh, UNGA is, wait for it, the United States. President Macron from France is staying home. The UK's uh, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is at home. China, Xi Jinping, and of course, Russia's President Vladimir Putin. What does it say, DSG, about the importance of a gathering like this in New York when uh, you know, the power brokers, uh, or certainly with the largest clout in the world, uh, are not coming? There are going to be a lot of questions out for, for leaders who have power as to why they're not at the table when the global town hall comes together and they will have the explanations they have. So you agree it's not good that they're not? I don't think it's, I, I think it's not good. I think that uh, when uh, the P5 don't turn up for a meeting of this um, importance, it's not just a general debate. 
it is halfway through what we need to do uh, for humanity in consideration of the planet. And, and these are really big crises when you look at the figures on poverty, inequality, um, and the climate crisis. So they should be here because they are the ones who can step up and make the, the change, the pivot to getting to 2030. Having said that, there are 193 states and there are heads of state and government of countries small with loud voices who can move um, people to action and you know we have great women like uh, prime minister mia motley from barbados small island big voice Personally. has put has put those issues in front of people where the big leaders have come up to the table you'll see in the g20 declaration that um, those issues have been acknowledged we now have a hook we can take this forward in the discussions that we have um, uh, next week and you know we will miss our big leaders uh, right. but we will the show will go on and we are also seeing some divergent views in terms of for example the uh conversation around energy transition and fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. One of the key meetings next week is a climate ambition summit and part of that is this race, right, to eradicate fossil fuels from the planet. But countries like South Africa are claiming energy poverty and the need to use natural resources, including new oil and gas exploration, to strengthen the economy and build the energy security they seek. How do you respond to that sort of narrative? Well, the first thing I'd be asking is that are they um, in the narrative that says we've got to see an end to fossil fuels um, and that is the right direction in which we need to get to for net zero. And I think every one of those countries will say absolutely. They signed up to the Paris. But agreement. not by 2040 or by 2050. Which maybe, are maybe, maybe not. But I mean, they need to start that journey. And I think, you know, very much uh, countries that had least to do with what we're receiving from climate probably need to look at the, the, the pact that the SG suggests, which is emerging economies um, can do a little more, but the developed economies can do so much more. And somewhere we will find the balance to get transitions that are just and equitable for many de developing countries um, on track. You know, once you start that 10, 20, 30 mile journey, um, if you can accelerate right. halfway across, it may be that we make those lines. We've just got to start and we've got to do less talking about what is not appropriate and more about what we can get done. Because right now, we're reversing. We're not going forward. And we really need to get forward on those. But isn't transitions. exploring for new oil deposits reversing? Let me tell you what South Africa's Mineral Resources and Energy Minister Gweda Mantashe says. Quote, we can't be only about decarbonization. We must deal with energy poverty. We must never allow ourselves to be encircled by the developed nations who fund lobbyists to put our country's developmental needs against their own self-serving protection of the environment. Our country deserves an opportunity tr to transition at pace and scale determined by its citizens. I mean, that's pretty specific stuff. It's it very, very much specific. counters the narrative coming out no, of the and It's very specific, but you, you have... Uh, you have conversations on energy security today. You have uh, some of our Security Council members who are putting out a hundred new, um, signing up a hundred new uh, exploration licenses in their territory. Um, these are for countries that are already developed. I think that we have to listen to what um, developing countries are saying. I think that there is a lot of um, there's a lot of justification to say, yes, my citizens come first. After all, that's why they're elected to government, to take care of their interests. However, I do think that in the green transition, we need to look for those resources that would allow that greener transition to happen faster. In the case of the just transition in South Africa, those resources were not forthcoming as quickly as they thought they would be. And by the way, when you're looking at developing countries without the infrastructure to make these ha transitions really fast, they could leapfrog if they got the resources for the green transition. Yeah, the SDG if they don't, if they don't, it will take much longer.